Margaret Brennan. Thank you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us if last night Philippine President Duterte offered his apology to you mm -hmm. and if you said to him the U.S. will continue to help the Philippines push back against China? And last night, sir, uh, Donald Trump said, Vladimir Putin has been more of a leader than you, and then he said you have reduced American generals to rubble. Do you care to defend your legacy? <laughs> Do I care to defend? Okay, respond. okay, okay, respond, got it. Um, uh, I did shake hands with President Duterte uh, last night. Um, it was not a long interaction, and uh, what I indicated to him is, is that uh, my team uh, should be meeting with his and determine how we can uh, move forward on a whole range of issues. Uh, as I said when I was asked about this uh, in China, uh, I don't take these comments personally because it seems as if this is uh, a phrase he's used repeatedly including directed at the Pope and others. And so uh, I think it seems to be just uh, you know, a, a habit, uh, a way of speaking for him. Um, but as I said in China, you know, we want to partner with the Philippines on the particular issue of narco traffickers, which is a serious problem in the Philippines. It's a serious problem in the United States and, and around the world. On that narrow issue, we do want to make sure that the partnership we have is consistent with international norms uh, and rule of law. Uh, so we're not going to back off our position that if we're working with a country, whether it's on anti-terrorism, whether it's on uh, going after drug traffickers, uh, as despicable as these networks may be, as much damage as they do, uh, it is important from our perspective to make sure that uh, we do it the right way. Because the consequences of when you do it the wrong way is innocent people get hurt. Uh, and you have a whole bunch of unintended consequences that uh, don't solve the problem. It has no impact on our broader relationship with the Philippine people, on the wide range of programs and security cooperation that we have with this treaty uh, ally. And it certainly has no impact in terms of how we interpret our obligations to uh, continue to build on uh, the long-standing alliance that we have with the Philippines, however uh, that may play itself out. And uh, uh, you know, my hope and expectation is, is that uh, uh, as uh, President Duterte uh, and his team uh, get acclimated to uh, his new position, uh, that they're able to define and uh, clarify what exactly they want to get done, uh, how that fits in with the work uh, that we're already doing with the Philippine government, and uh, hopefully it'll be uh, on a, a strong footing by the time the next administration comes in. As far as Mr. Trump, I've, I think I've already offered my opinion. I don't think the guy's qualified to be President of the United States. And every time he speaks, that uh, opinion is confirmed. And I think the most important thing for the public and the press is to just listen to what he says and follow up and ask questions about what appear to be either contradictory or uninformed or outright wacky ideas. Uh, there is this process that seems to take place over the course of the election season where somehow behavior that in normal times we would consider completely unacceptable and outrageous becomes normalized. And people start thinking that uh, we should be grading on a curve. But uh, I can tell you from the interactions that I've had over the last 
uh, eight or nine days with foreign leaders that this is serious business. And you actually have to know what you're talking about and you actually have to uh, have done your homework. And when you speak, it should actually reflect thought out policy that you can implement. Um, and I have confidence that if, in fact, people just listen to what he has to say and look at his track record or lack thereof, that they'll make a good decision. Elise Hu. Thank you very much, Mr. President. On North Korea, there's increasing evidence that China isn't enforcing economic sanctions, namely when it comes to coal. So what's the next move there in your yeah. remaining four and a half months in office? Mm -hmm. And second, is it time for a fundamental rethink of North Korea policy, given that all these years of condemnations and increasing sanctions haven't led to a desired outcome? Good. Thank you. Well, th th those are good questions. Uh, in my meeting with President Xi, we emphasized the importance of full implementation of the UN sanctions uh, that have been put forward. Uh, I can tell you that based on not only their presentations, but actually uh, intelligence and evidence that we've seen, uh, China has done more on sanctions implementation than they have on some of the previous UN Security Council sanctions. But you are absolutely right that there are still places where they need to tighten up, and we continue to indicate to them the importance of tightening those up. Um, you may have noted that uh, China continues to object to the FAD deployment in the Republic of Korea, one of our treaty allies. And what I've said to President Xi directly is that we cannot have a situation where we're unable to defend either ourselves or our treaty allies uh, against increasingly provocative behavior and uh, escalating capabilities by the North Koreans. And I indicated to him that if the THAAD bothered him, particularly since uh, it has no purpose other than defensive and does not change the strategic balance between the United States and China, that uh, they need to work with us more effectively uh, to ch change Pyongyang's behavior. Now, when it comes to changing Pyongyang's behavior, it's tough. Uh, it is true that our approach, my approach since I've been president, is to not reward bad behavior. And that was based on the fact that before I came into office, you had a pattern in which uh, North Korea would engage in some provocative action and as a consequence of the equivalent of throwing a tantrum, countries would then try to placate them by giving them humanitarian aid or uh, providing other concessions or engaging in dialogue, uh, which would relieve some of the pressure, and then they would just go right back to uh, the same provocative behavior later. And, and so our view was, that wasn't working, let's try something else. Now, it is entirely fair to say that they have continued to uh, engage in the development of their nuclear program and these ballistic missile tests. Uh, and so we are con constantly examining other strategies that we can take, close consultations with Republic of Korea and Japan, as well as China, and Russia and others who are interested parties. Uh, and uh, we do believe that if there are any signs at any point that North Korea is serious about dialogue around denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula, that we'll be ready to have those conversations. Um, it's not as if we are looking for uh, a problem or avoiding uh, a willingness to engage diplomatically, but diplomacy requires uh, that Pyongyang meet its international obligations, and not only is it failing to meet those international obligations, it's not even suggesting that um, they have any intention to do so anytime in the future, regardless of. Uh, the inducements that might be put 
uh, on the table. So, uh, uh, look, we, we are deeply disturbed by what's happened. We are going to make sure that we put our defensive measures in place so that America is protected, our allies are protected. We will continue to put some of the toughest pressure that North Korea has uh, ever been under as a consequence of this behavior. Can I guarantee that it works? No. Uh, but it is the best options that we have available to us right now, uh, and we will continue to explore with all parties involved, including China, other uh, potential means by which we can uh, bring about a change in behavior. Bob Woodard. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to let you know that this is going to be more of a personal question for you. We are uh, almost the same exact age, born in August 1961, but I'm two weeks younger than you. You know, I noticed that when we were in the gym together, you were working out a little harder than me. So <laughs> those two so weeks clearly are making a difference. <laughs> but I want to ask you about uh, some of your thoughts all those years ago, since uh, we were living in those days of the Vietnam era. What were your thoughts about Vietnam, the war at that time, and certainly as time went on, but more importantly about the secret war when you found out about that and also as time went by? Do you, given what you learned about that and what you see now and what you witnessed when you're here, do you, do you think you should apologize fully to the country of Laos? And one other very important thing, too, is for those American veterans who did serve in the secret war, those that are special ops, CIA, certainly you know, pilots that dropped the bombs, uh, those are the ones that targeted known enemies in a war they did not create. Would you be comfortable in Laos calling them heroes as we do with those that served in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, uh, because we're the same age, you'll recall that sort of at the peak of the war, uh, we were still too young, I think, to fully understand the scope of what was taking place. Um, it was the tail end of the war where uh, we're entering high school and starting to understand uh, the meaning of it. But at that point, uh, it was, uh, uh, I, th I think, the debate had raged. Uh, even those who had been strong supporters of the war recognized there needed to be some mechanism to bring it to an end. Um, and so, so I can't say that I was so precocious that I had deep thoughts about it at the time, other than the images that we all saw on television. Um, standing here now, in retrospect, uh, I think uh, what I can say is that uh, you know, the United States was on the right side of history when it came to the Cold War. Uh, there may have been moments, particularly here in Southeast Asia, in which in our singular focus on uh, defeating uh, a, an expansionist uh, and very aggressive uh, communism that we didn't think through all the implications of what we did as policymakers. Um, and certainly, you know, when you see uh, the dropping of cluster bombs, trying to figure out how that was going to be effective, uh, particularly since part of the job was to win over hearts and minds, uh, how that was going to work. Um, I think with the benefit of hindsight, uh, you know, we'd have to say that uh, a lot of those consequences were not ones that uh, necessarily served our interests. Having said that, I've, and I've said this before, um, regardless of what happens in the White House and decisions made by policymakers, when our men and women in uniform go into action and put their lives on the line and are carrying out their duty, uh, my attitude is they're always heroes because uh, they, are, they are saying that I am willing to do whatever it takes, what my commander-in-chief has ordered, in order to keep the American people safe. And by definition, their job is to uh, put their lives on the line and make 
sacrifices, uh, both seen and unseen, that uh, have long-standing ramifications. And, and, and that act of sacrifice is, is heroic. Um, and, and one of the things that, uh, you know, when I think about in terms of legacy, uh, and I think, reflect back on uh, my presidency as, uh, as it comes to an end, is the degree to which I came in respecting and honoring our men and women in uniform. Uh, I leave here even more in awe of what they do. Uh, and it also is one of the reasons why I take so seriously the decisions I make about war and peace. Because I know whatever decision I make, there are men and women out there who will carry out my decision, even if they think it's wrong, even if they didn't vote for me, even if uh, they have completely different ideas about what's required for our national security. Um, that's heroism. That's service. That's the definition of it. And that puts a special burden on the occupant of my office to get it right, or at least as right as you can. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, when people look back 20 years from now or 30 years from now, the decisions I made, they'll be able to say that uh, he did pretty good. All right? Thank you very much, everybody. Let's go home.